This week on the It's a Monkey podcast. Because you have this Mittelstand, they're those old family-run businesses down like in... Faber-Castell, right? Faber-Castell. They're not stock listed. Right. So a lot of the board members or even the Porsche family who bought out Volkswagen, that family is also reclusive. It's a family-run board. So essentially they brought in some experts onto this board, but they for themselves are still running the company that was set up by the grandfather or the great-grandfather some 200 years ago. So it's quite unique to Germany. So... Then you've maybe then got what we're talking about too, let's say startups or smaller businesses, mums and dad type businesses, and they run on perhaps what we might be more familiar with here in Australia, so some kind of like a PTY. Right. So they're kind of the three structures that you would see depending on the nature of the business. Good evening, hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Kevin Garber. It is Wednesday where we are recording this podcast um, on Wednesday the 15th of March. Uh, we usually periscope it, but we're not periscoping it today. You're probably listening to it on Friday the 17th of March. My name is Kevin Garber. I am the CEO of Manage Flitter, and this is episode 85 of the It's a Monkey podcast where we talk about everything relating to tech, startups, the tech economy, um, and all those exciting bits and pieces. And as usual, I have with me uh, my co-host, Kate Frappel, who's the design lead at Manage Flitter. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be back. Um, coming up later on the show, we have an interview um, with Petra Zlatevska, who is a writer, lecturer, and creative professional in Berlin. Uh, Petra reached out to us. Uh, she said she's based in Berlin. She's actually an Australian and... Um, she uh, would like to share with us some of the activities and the lay of the land in the Berlin tech scene. So she popped into the studio and uh, we spoke with her a little bit about the Berlin tech scene, which was really quite interesting. We chatted a lot about Silicon Valley, New York, Sydney, uh, even Tel Aviv, places like that. But we haven't touched on the Berlin tech scene. So we'll be talking um, a little bit about that um, later on in the show, so stick with us. We're going to get to the tech news shortly, as we usually do. But before then, we've actually had a startup minute come in. Um, so we're just going to go to that, um, and we'll be back in half a minute. My name's Reggie Milligan, and I'm a co-founder at Mantry, the modern man's pantry, which is M-A-N-T-R-Y dot com. Uh, we do a food subscription business tailored to guys, sending six different products every two months. Maybe the best barbecue sauce from Alabama or the best salami from Vermont. I love listening to podcasts, especially like It's a Monkey. Uh, I think that one of the best quotes I ever heard as a founder is that you always learn more listening to other entrepreneurs' experiences than any how-to book. So this podcast and others are a great way for me to learn. I appreciate the opportunity. You can check us out again. It's Mantry, M-A-N-T-R-Y dot com. It's a great place to find the best undiscovered food makers in America. Thank you. So the Startup Minute is a segment. If you're a, a small company, a new company, and you'd like to get some promotion and you listen to this podcast, send us an audio file between, I don't know, 15 to 25 seconds long. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. And importantly, it's free. I've had a few people email me and say, do we have to pay to get on the podcast? No, this is free. It's our little way of giving back to the community. Um, we'll put your details on the show notes so you'll get that all-important link to your company and um, it's absolutely free. So all it takes is 20 seconds of your time and you can uh, send it through to us and there is no cost. So um, yeah, so feel free to send away. Kate, as, uh, as usual, um, before we get into the tech news, uh, well, how's Snapchat's price doing? How's Snap's price doing? Have you followed that at all? Mm, no, I can't say I've remembered. I can look it up now. They estimated it was going to fall down to about 19. That's 20. 
So it's still vastly off its highs of uh, 28, and then it came down to 24. It, of course, listed at 17. We chat about that, by the way, in our previous week's podcast, where we also spoke with Anil Dash, who is the CEO of Fog Creek Software. And uh, I, I love that conversation. Anil is such a fantastically smart guy, and he even worked um, for one of the, the working groups for the Obama administration in advising them on, on digital and social. So if you've missed that, go back to episode um, – 84. Um, you can get all that previous episode at itsamonkey.com. So, yeah, so Snap's been been drifting downwards. It's now at 20.58. So uh, maybe it will get low enough and it'll be a good time to buy. But anyway, we speak about Snap in last week's podcast. This week's podcast, uh, Tech News, some interesting news uh, out of Intel, which, of course, now Intel runs most of the personal computers, Macs, uh, PCs, they, 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 all the chips inside the PCs um, are Intel chips. Interestingly, they don't dominate in the, the mobile market where another company called Qualcomm actually dominates in that market. So it's um, quite competitive there. But, but news um, that came out of uh, Intel and Israel um, the last few days is that Intel is to buy Israel's Mobileye for $20 billion, well, sorry, that's Australian dollars, for $15 US billion, which is a, a, a huge amount. Mobilize listed uh, on the stock exchange. It was worth, a, the New York Stock Exchange, it was worth about $10 billion, so they paid a nice premium for it. Now, what's so interesting about the story is actually the technology behind Mobileye. Uh, Mobileye um, was founded in 1999 by academics, and it's, it's a technology that's um, in the, the self driving car and truck space. And I think their first product was to help trucks or cars identify pedestrians on the side of the road. And there's some fascinating videos that uh, show the use of this technology that it flags. If you're driving, right, you're looking straight ahead, you actually, your field of view is quite focused. So you actually miss a lot of the activity on the side of their road. And first, some of their first technology was to flag you if there was something um, on the pavements that could be a threat, whether it's uh, someone standing still or someone walking. And they have evolved that technology over the years to um, ride on through to the, the self-driving technology and, and companies like BMW and General Motors all use mobilized technology. So Intel is really behind in this technology and they want to really get into that, uh, you know, the technology side of cars. So they're leapfrogging it by uh, buying Mobileye. And what's quite interesting about mobilized technology is you can retrofit some of this technology, meaning that if your car doesn't come with this technology, or your truck, because trucking is a huge industry as well for this side of things. Of course, trucks are on the road a lot long, longer um, or more frequently than most cars. So a lot of the safety technology is very important for trucks. And you can retrofit some of this technology so you don't have to, it doesn't have to be factory fitted. So really interesting tech behind this. And Intel obviously is taking a long-term view that this is going to be a big deal and decided to purchase that uh, the entire company. Yeah, they were... Um falling behind in the autonomous driving space by 2030 they are saying the market for autonomous cars will be around 70 billion dollars and actually mike cannon brooks who's uh, one of the founders of atlassian uh, was on record at a tech conference or business conference a few weeks ago saying that the Australian government is really sticking their head in the sand with the impact that um, self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles are going to have on the economy of course um, transport is one of the biggest employers in the world and the impact of autonomous vehicles is going to be very high on people that work in that field. Of course, from a safety factor, it's fantastic, right? Um, there are so many avoidable, unfortunately, pedestrian deaths, car crashes, that technology um, will absolutely no doubt prevent a huge amount of them. Definitely. Well, one of the features mobile eye can do, mobile eye can do as well is they can brake for you. Uh, they can warn of lane departure and also control your speed. If you've got um, some of those cruise control features, um, if it picks up something like an animal about it running across the road, um, slows down. Slows down for you, which is, I mean, th there's a famous video of Tesla, which in Tesla also has an autopilot feature. Interestingly, uh, mobile eye had a falling out with Tesla over that very feature. 
I, I saw that. That'd be interesting. I haven't read the details of that, but uh, you know, a lot of these very smart people, they they're very um, opinionated and um, passionate is the word I'm looking for. So it's healthy for the industry that some of these leading people are debating. But there's a Tesla example where Tesla vehicle saw a crash before the driver saw the crash uh, ahead of him, mm. and. Um, those few seconds that the Tesla braked before the driver could brake meant that the uh, th- that he didn't go into the back of this vehicle yeah. that was about to crash. So the Tesla saw that the vehicle in front was about to crash, worked that out, braked, and gave just that much extra time. So this technology is fantastic. So Intel's going to be in there, and Intel's soon going to be in all of our cars as long as all of our PCs. Um, so it'll be interesting we to see. We are fighting with Qualcomm. They are, yeah, and this competition is good for everyone, um, yeah. and that that's the that's the great thing. Uh, so the second news item this week is Bitcoin blockchain. Um, as you know, it's one of my pet interests, and Bitcoin's been in the news this week um, for a couple of reasons, and been in the news for last week for a couple of reasons. And um, I'm excited to say I've actually dragged into the studio because he is a local, Tim Lee, who's the author of Down the Rabbit Hole, a book about the blockchain. And if you're on Periscope, you know, Tim's going to actually ho- hold it up and you can actually, actually the, the, the camera's there. Oh, yeah, so there you, can, right, you can actually um, go. see the book. And um, I've dragged in Tim to, to, to comment about what's been going on with Bitcoin. Just to set the scene, Bitcoin passed the price of gold last week for the first time of, of $1,000 plus or US, whatever that was. And then on Friday, the, 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 an ETF, which is an index type fund, which uh, in the US, the SEC knocked it back and said this e- Bitcoin ETF fund, um, they're not going to allow this ETF fund through. And then the Bitcoin pr- price crashed. Um, it has recovered. So there's a lot of interesting bits and pieces. Tim, tell us what's going on with Bitcoin. Oh, where do you start? I mean, it's um, – uh, and I, I guess the first thing I've got to say, this is not investment advice, just to, for, you know, for clear clarity for everybody's point of view. I think Bitcoin is gaining so much traction, and it's gaining traction for a number of different reasons. Number one, uh, it's representing digital gold. So, for example, when Brexit happened, it rose by 15%. When Donald Trump got in, it rose by 4.5%. So it's got that safe harbour sort of capacity. Um, Equally, it's being used by a number of different um, jurisdictions for for various reasons which are... Um, for which there are sort of global economic forces at play. So, for example, in Venezuela, the inflation rate is completely out of control. And as a result, the currency is just devaluing every single day. It means that people want somewhere safe to actually put put their their local currency. The irony is, sorry to interrupt you there, the irony is that Bitcoin is not controlled by anyone and is providing safe harbor. Right. Yes. And I think I think this goes to the the actual point of blockchain that this is the power of it, right? It's it's decentralized and but it's um, robust in terms of its trust. Yeah, Bitcoin is um, because it is uh, decentralized and it's essentially owned by the community itself. So there's no government that is backing it. There's no centralized massive multinational corporation behind it. Nobody owns it. And it, it's, it is slightly weird that this is just an entry on a ledger, and each of those entries on a ledger is now worth close to 1250 US dollars. So tell us specifically what happened last week, especially in relation to the ETF um, okay. SEC decision. Right. Um, the, the Winklevoss brothers, who are of Facebook fame, uh-huh. um, had put an application in. It's been going on for about four years now, where they were looking towards providing a regulated structure to actually invest in Bitcoin. Because the biggest challenge is if you try to invest in Bitcoin, you've got to have a wallet, you've got to set it up, you've got to look after your private key. And there is this software all over the internet trying to find people's personal private keys on their computers. So there's, it's high risk. Basically, Bitcoin is taking out the banks. And that means that we become our own bank. And so it, it presents a lot of challenges. It doesn't make it easy to hold Bitcoin. They were going to be the custodians of people's money in terms of we'll take care of all that sort of stuff. You just invest your money and we will invest it in Bitcoin. 
But why do they call it an ETF fund? I mean, that is essentially, an index fund, as far as I understand it, is you're buying a, um, a group of securities, right? So why, how does it's, it work that it, it's a Bitcoin ETF fund? Well, it's, it's fundamentally that they peg everything to the Bitcoin price. So they'll, they'll trade in and out of it. Right. Uh, you know, so they'll trade the ups and the downs, and they'll, they'll manage that process. <laughs> and so essentially, uh, from my understanding, and I mean... Uh, I, I wasn't planned, planning to be a user because obviously I'm involved, I've got Bitcoin myself, but essentially it meant that you didn't have to get involved in the deep tech ultimately to get into Bitcoin and they would manage that process and they'll take fees out of the, out of the management fees out of the top end. And they, um, that's what the industry has desperately been trying to do is to um, abstract a level on top of the technology, right? Um, it's so to, to actually make it simpler and easier to 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 deal with Bitcoin because it's still it's still very um, it's still very early internet nineteen ninety four no, days right exactly exactly and the the estimations are there was uh, an investment bank that put a uh, an analysis out and they estimated um, that around three hundred million dollars worth of assets would go into this fund in the first week that's how powerful this potential uh, ETF was going to be. It's an idea. I mean, blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency, it's an idea that's just, just um, it's, it's, it's aching to be born, right? Completely. There's a lot of latent demand for it. And the, the overall issue was that the Bitcoin price had actually factored in the fact that the decision was going to be coming up. So they'd already, I mean, it's the age old thing in any form of trading. It's sort of you buy the rumor, you sell the news. That's the age-old way in which things work. So you buy the rumor, which was happening a couple of weeks ago, and then you just, uh, I mean, I, I personally kept a very, very close eye on the futures market that was in place to, you could actually buy a contract to either support the decision or go against the decision. And the, the market was sort of saying it was going to be between 29 and 44% chance of it succeeding. Right. So armed with that... Towards the tail end of last week, I actually sold half my Bitcoin into US dollars and converted the rest into alternative currencies, expecting that if it actually went down, I wouldn't because you know the the market the futures were saying it could well go down. And as it happens, as soon as the decision was made, it fell by fifteen percent in about ten minutes. But interesting, it's nearly back up. To oh, where it's it was, nearly back right? up again. And the thing that that shows is the underlying strength and the underlying fundamental strength of of Bitcoin. And there are, I guess, there are three core reasons behind that. One, digital gold, um, which, as we sort of alluded to earlier, is the idea that in, in difficult situations, you know, people resort to a comfortable environment like gold. Traditionally, when Brexit happened, Bitcoin rose by 15%. When Donald Trump got in, it rose by 4.5%. That's one side. The second side is that it's been seen as a reserve currency for the cryptocurrency space. So, for example, there are around 620 different cryptocurrency coins in the marketplace at the moment. And there are lots of what is called generally an initial coin offering. Uh, but I don't want to sort of dwell too heavily on that right now. But there are, there are parties that are creating cryptocurrency coins, and those are available to buy and to sell in the market. Now, to get into those coins, you have to go typically via Bitcoin. Okay. Right, so, so it's, it's becoming a a bit, it's becoming a reserve currency, if right. you like. All right? the, the U.S. dollars of a uh, cryptocurrency. Exactly right. And then you've got the other side where there are geopolitical forces going on right now, like in Venezuela, where the inflation rate's completely out of control. People do not want to have their money in the local currency because it's going to devalue every single day. And they've got currency, very heavy currency controls in place for traditional. Um, you know, currencies like the US dollar and that type of thing. This mirrors what happened in Argentina from you know, 2012 to 14, where Bitcoin became the actual the currency of choice in terms of getting money out of Argentina. Because at that time, for example, in Argentina, they were charging 35% uh, surcharge on credit cards for any external purchases bought Someone in the US. Someone making a lot of money. <coughs> well, but, but, but it was actually, they, they actually had to trade, this is in Argentina, via uh, organizations called Cuevas. Right. And they were sort of the, on the gray market, right. uh, sort of illegal, but recognized that it was 
going on. Yeah. And this has actually been happening also in China because they've China have actually imposed currency control restrictions. And the, uh, generally speaking, I, and I forget the exact number because it does tend to sort of vary slightly, but it's around fifty thousand dollars is all you can actually export out of China. It's okay. amazing. It's amazing on a on a philosophical level that in society everything wants to be free. Information wants to be free. Currency wants to be free. Everything is wants to wants to be it unencumbered. Wants to right? find its own natural level. Mm. Wants to find its own natural route. But of course, the SEC. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. the SEC's biggest issue was that right? They said that one yeah. of the reasons they're not letting it through is because it's it's no one controls it. And well, that's it, and it's the the cryptocurrency markets are highly unregulated, or they're unregulated, and so you get a lot of manipulation going on. People push the price up, they push it down. You get pumps and dumps, which typically exist in the in the equities market, and they're totally illegal in the equity markets. In cryptocurrency, it's a very grey area because nobody's actually really tested the, the test case. So the, the prices get manipulated. So if you've got an unregulated currency in an unregulated market, the SEC are going to find it incredibly hard to regulate. And that's the, pragm that's the pragmatism behind uh, sort of corporate and regulation getting behind this type of structure. It will change over time once that regulation begins to be seen, I think, in the cryptocurrency space in general. And there's, they're getting whiffs of it with you know, China now forcing the exchanges to increase their anti-money laundering and know-your-customer type of regimes in terms of getting money you know, um, into Bitcoin and back into Juan or US, US dollars, pardon me, US dollars, whatever it might be. So all these things are, cons are, are sort of driving interest in the in the overall space and i mean you know because of the ability to transfer cash i mean i can transfer money from one of the exchanges in the states to australia in half an hour and it's cleared now i actually um paid someone a contractor that we have working for us in eastern europe and i uh, researched all the options and um, bitcoin was the easiest and in 20 minutes not only was the easiest it was the cheapest some of the um, you know, remittance services charge up to 10%. The, uh, and this is the crazy thing. I mean, I mean, I've done a lot of presentations and speeches at various conferences. And one of the things I always talk about is, especially here in Australia, I'll use Australia because that's where we're based at the moment, but I've got money in the UK, all right? Now, it's quicker for me to fly to the UK, go to my bank in the UK, draw the money out, fly back, and I'll get the money quicker here than going via the banking system. Yeah, no, it's, right. it's, it's, and, it, and in well, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, generally speaking, in an hour, it's it's cleared and it'll cost you cents instead of the banks charging you 50 bucks, plus a low, uh, you know, two and a half to four and a half percent below the exchange rate. And as long as the trust is there, which is what the banks are offering us, as long as that part is genuine trust, you don't have a Mt. Gox situation where people lose their, their wallets and things like that. Um, um, anyway, Tim Lee, we, we we unfortunately don't have much more time today. We're going to have oh, you. We're <laughs> going to have you regularly on the show because I think the blockchain space. Um, oh, you know, it's it's, it's, it's the next change. It's the next. It's it's going to be bigger than the internet. It'll do for money what the internet did to media. Well, essentially, you know, as it's been described, um, or at least Bitcoin's been described as programmable money, which yep. makes a whole lot of sense, especially with the new digital environment. The blockchain is the distributed system of trust, makes a whole lot of sense with all these intermediaries. So if you're listening to this podcast, and especially if you're someone going into university or something like that, Bitcoin blockchain is, is really a hot area. I will say just one thing, if I may. Sure. Okay, my final thing, okay? Uh -huh. There's uh, out of China, there's a company called Wang Zhang, uh -huh. big industrial car company, uh -huh. you know, generally. But they do a lot of other things. Right. They announced in September last year a $30 billion fund. Uh -huh over seven years to fund smart cities, which is blockchain and Internet of Things. And if you consider the whole of the venture capital market last year was around $60 billion, this is just one company in China that has seen the potential. And that's why, you know, the blockchain just is not going away. And I believe uh, the Chinese government is behind a lot of the Bitcoin mining, right? Yeah. Or no one knows. It's speculation. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, there can be a lot of speculation. I mean, there are mining groups. I mean, seventy 
between 70 and 80 percent of all, all bitcoins are mined in China because of the cheap electricity. You know, in the early days of the internet, um, when when jurisdiction seemed complex, I mean, there were the same sort of issues. People were wondering about, well, you know, what happens if you um, view content that's illegal in Australia, but the, it's, the servers are in, in Russia, and it's you know, how do we deal with all of this? And we've managed to deal with it. So and 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 quite well, I think, in fact. So there's there's, I, I think the benefits are just way too big. But we're going to have you back on no, the. No, no, no. But be very pleased to come back. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm a total evangelist, and I mean, I mean, obviously, if anybody's really interested in learning more, I mean, the book is on is on Amazon Kindle. It's called Down the Rabbit we'll, Hole: Discover the Power of the Blockchain. We'll we'll put um, links on the show notes. I've Fantastic. got a copy of um, Tim's book, and I've actually read Tim's articles. I bump into them on Quora. So if you're interested in Bitcoin and blockchain, and wondering why we sit here so excited, like two <laughs> two young boys, <laughs> you know, go have a look at Tim's articles on Quora. He explains some of this technology fantastic um kate my co-host and producer and right hand person uh, have a look at tim's articles on Cora. it's a great great place to start and uh, because it can be a little bit tricky to get into so um thanks for joining us bitcoin we're gonna we're gonna follow it um with interest and let's have you back in a couple of months no, and that, talk that's, about that's new great, Kevin. thanks for the invite and appreciate it kate as well so that's tim lee author of down the rabbit hole um Great book about the blockchain. We'll put show notes and uh, thanks, Tim. Hi, my name is Dave Zarati, and I'm the customer support specialist here at Manage Flitter. Manage Flitter is a tool that helps you work faster and smarter on Twitter. With Manage Flitter, you can clean up and grow your Twitter account. You will also get access to useful Twitter analytics, social content scheduling, and much more. Go to manageflitter.com and start your free trial today. You're back with It's a Monkey Podcast. We talk about everything relating to tech, startups, entrepreneurship, um, startup ecosystems is one of the things that I'm interested in. We've obviously chat to a lot of people in the US, um, you know, the two of the big startup ecosystems there, San Francisco and New York. We've chatted to people, obviously, in Sydney, um, even in South Africa, Israel. One of the startup ecosystems that we actually haven't spoken about, which is quite a, it's quite a significant startup ecosystems for reasons we'll discover shortly um, is Berlin in Germany and I'm happy to say I've actually got someone who lives in Berlin involved in the startup ecosystem Petra Zlatenska um, I think I might have <laughs> after all my practicing I think they got that wrong right it was pretty close um, Zlat Zlatevska um, from um, who's a Berlin-based writer lecturer and communications professional is with us in the studio. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's great to be here. So when I think of Berlin's startup ecosystem, the first thing that comes to mind is Spotify. Mm -hmm. Right. They base their HQs in Berlin, right? Yes, that's correct. They're on the banks of the um, river um, that's located around the Kreuzberg Media Precinct. So tell us about, um, I mean, in Australia, actually, we don't you know, when I'm in Silicon Valley and, and particularly in Israel as well, I hear a lot about the Berlin um, tech ecosystem. But I think a lot of Australians don't know much about the, the sorry, the Berlin tech ecosystem. A lot of Australians don't know much about the Berlin tech ecosystem. Give us a little bit of the lay of the land, how it relates to San Francisco, New York, Sydney. Okay, well, I guess the first thing to mention to all the listeners is that Berlin is not really Germany and that's because of its history. So going back to the time that it was a real hub for artists and for creative people even back um, before the Second World War and then we know that the history since that period of time meant that there was an East and a West part. So what tended to happen was um, during the time of the city being this island in the middle of the former East German Republic was this hub of creativity, this hub of activity. So... People tend to say that first came the artists, then came the musicians and the DJs. And then we had in West Berlin during the time of the 70s, obviously David Bowie and Iggy Pop. But also it's good to remember that in the East, there was a lot happening with the arts and music. Obviously back then there was no business. There was – everything had been destroyed in the war. So it's important to know that um, most of the industry was centred around Munich in the automotive industry and around the Black Forest where you had the growth of these Mittelstand, which are family-run businesses which have under 200 employees. So that's where most of the economic drivers were coming from. 
So once we had reunification, um, then we had this kind of explosion of art, music, the city was together, but there was lots of these undiscovered pockets. Rent was cheap. And um, I'd probably say in the mid-90s to late 90s was when a lot of the up-and-coming um, yeah, entrepreneurs, I guess the first wave, were British, Scandinavian, and a lot of them in the property sector. And then when we come to the early 2000s to mid-2000s, um, we had the growth of Rocket Internet, which was set up by three of brothers. So, so that, the Samway so brothers. So they started their whole um, operations in Berlin. So that's just by way of background that it's different to San Francisco, Silicon Valley or what we would have seen and experienced in London. History is one thing but also the way that business operates. There's no stock exchange in Berlin. There's um, – it's – it's, 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 it's a city where you've got a chance to, to fail but you've also got time to succeed. So that distinguishes it from these other cities. People don't feel stressed. So the people in Berlin, I mean, what percentage are non-Germans versus people from everywhere else approximately? Approximately. Well, the statistics are constantly changing around that. But at the moment, I think in terms of professional migrants, so you've got to also distinguish there's a lot of um, people who came out to Berlin um, f during the 1970s and they were these Gastarbeiter, so they were blue-collar workers. But we're talking purely about professional mm -hmm. migrants who've come out, let's say, in the last five to ten years. I think a good um, – oh. My last statistic on that was um, maybe 100,000 to 150,000 are coming into the city. Out of a city of how many? Well, the current population of Berlin is just on 4 million. Right. So, so it's still pretty small. It's, yeah, it's not huge and that's the thing. So the talent pool is there and these are people who are coming um, from Silicon Valley. They're coming from New York, also from around London in the wake of Brexit Scandinavia um, and actually the biggest influx of professional people from the startup um, and digital communities are coming from Tel Aviv. I, I believe mm. that and um, I've spent a bit of time in Israel and the Israelis love Berlin. Mm. They just love Berlin. I think it's, it's close, it's cheap, um, it, it doesn't have that intensity because of the political situation. Mm. Israel is very intense and I think it doesn't, it's got what I've heard, I've never been to Berlin, but a, a more creative intensity than a political intensity. Mm, absolutely. I mean, it is the seat of government, so different to San Francisco where obviously everything happens in Washington in terms of politics. But that's always been um, how Berlin even was before the capital was born in West Germany. So now that everything's been reunified, you've got this kind of collision of um, all these kind of creative mm. business government forces coming together. And it is... Not so streamlined and organised as everyone would think. It is slightly chaotic, but that kind of is the secret to its success, I think. Many Australians there? Uh, there is a sizable community. Um, I know a few in the startup world um, and in media. And I and think, I think the, in the DJ world as well, right? In the DJ, there's quite a few in the music scene. So right. they came – so, for example, there's um, – I don't know, I mean, this is not really electronic music, but the head of the the intendant or the creative director of one of the opera houses is Barry Kosky, who right. originally came, um, he's Australian, but from Melbourne. So we're a very present kind of um, group and cohort, but uh, we've come a little bit later than the British or Americans or Scandinavian professionals. It's a long way for us to go. I mean, mm. it's, uh, you know, it's a big, big difference going from Tel Aviv to... Berlin and going from Sydney to Berlin. It's uh, Sydney to Berlin is a commitment. Right? It's a commitment. Interestingly, most of the people in creative tech and startup tend to come from Melbourne. Um, so you do have that access. And then when you meet someone from Sydney, such as me, or there's a couple of other people, you kind of think, oh, how did we all end up here? Why are we here? And um, why are we here? And how do we not end up um, in London, for example, which is where the typical kind of Sydney London access takes place. So if you're listening to us on the podcast or on Periscope, I'm chatting to Petra Zlatevska, um, who's a Berlin-based writer, lecturer and communications professional who grew up in Sydney, who speaks. How, talk us through the, the number of mm. languages that you speak. Well, I suppose I've always been a language buff and I studied French as part of my joint degree here in Sydney and uh, that was when I studied law and I was able to um, study for a year in Switzerland so I kept up with my French there but 
the real reason for going to Berlin was um, in the wake of the whole GFC. Um, my husband and I had just kind of decided it was time to make a change. And um, arriving upon Berlin, I actually was forced to do a German language course as part of my residency requirements. Hmm. And uh, the government paid for that uh, or subsidised it to a great degree. So the German came really at a much later stage in my life um, and I'd never had a love affair with German. I was always kind of a French buff but purely out of practicality I had to study German once there. And I've got to say also another thing that people may not realise is coming to Berlin, yes, everyone speaks fantastic English and there's this kind of melting pot of Scandinavians, Italians, um, Israelis, Australians but... I think the real reason, yeah, if you want to kind of have that success in getting a deal done, maybe securing funding for your new business or venture is to have German language skills, to be able to run a meeting. You could just get so much more, so much more authenticity and legitimacy to what you're proposing. Um, You've just scared away um, every <laughs> single Australian who was getting excited about going and well, starting a startup in Berlin. I think if someone had told me this um, eight years ago, I would have, and I'm glad I took the language course right at the beginning of the time that, um, yeah, of the time of starting up my new career there. So I would just encourage anyone who is seriously considering a move to Berlin to enrol in a language course first don't get tempted to put it off to later because you'll find that, yes, everyone speaks great English, but the real good deals are done when someone can trust you and we know that language and communication is the first point of establishing that trust. You know what I always say, and especially in the tech industry, right, We the, the epicentre of the tech industry is obviously technology and engineering and computer programming and AWS and servers. But what I always say, even to the team here at Managed Flitter, we're not a technology business. We are people business. Mm. Every business is a people business, right? And especially, yeah, if you're seeking funding or you're building out relationships, everything's relationships, everything's people. People love doing business with people that they like and they, and they yeah, absolutely can trust. And language is a, is a big one. So it, it makes sense. I mean, you know, when I came to Australia 20 years ago, I spent quite a bit of time observing Australians. Mm. Not, 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 uh, you know, not, <laughs> not, not in uh, with a notebook down at exactly. Park. Uh, well, <laughs> close, close though. I would be at parties and I would listen to the slang they used. I would watch their body language because it is very misleading that South Africa and Australia. You know, when you're in South Africa, you think, oh, we're so similar. We like the same sports. Mm. We drink barbecue. Oh, it's, it's just you know the the geography is different, but it's actually not. The subtlety is culture. You know, even from city to city, even in Australia, between mm. Sydney and Melbourne, the cultural nuances are different. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Um, and they, you can't always put a finger on it. You know, some things, and that's what's so lovely about traveling is every place has got its its different feel. Mm. But tell us about um, the the angel for the angel investing scene, the funding scene. There um, is it very active. Um, there's Sydney's evolved hugely over the last couple of years where it's uh, compounding every year. It sort of feels like it's, and, and this is probably not a stat, but it feels like it's almost doubling every 18 months, mm. the amount of funds for new businesses, both from angel investors and from um, early stage VCs. What's it like in, in Berlin? Well, one of the most recent statistics that I have is that let's say a decade ago, there was probably a handful of startups there and, you know, you had your Twitter, um, Skype was there and then we've recently seen Spotify. And at the end of 2015, there was a report released that stated there was over 2,000 new startups, so specifically 2,500 new startups. And those between them had secured over 2.4 billion euros in venture capital. So that's more than London and Paris and Stockholm combined. What time? Was that one year? That was at the end of 2015. So amongst right. that cohort of 2,500 new startups, I don't have the exact spread, but the figure was put at 2.4 billion euros into that sector by the end of 2015. Which is how much Australian approximately? Well, at the current exchange rate, um, Kate, have you got a calculator? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my, my maths hat on at the moment. I'm, uh, so let's think, stick with that figure and then um, – so that kind of represents, to put it into another statistic, only 9% of what startups and new businesses in Silicon Valley were taking – 
Um, so it's not a huge amount. And as we said before, Berlin as a city is quite small. It almost feels like a large village uh-huh. um, at that four million mark. And the it's kind about of the sa- same size of Sydney, right? Mm. Sydney's Sydney about four million. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I somehow thought Sydney had a little bit more, but um, yeah. Sydney was and like Melbourne are both, both about four par- million. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in that way. Another kind of distinguishing feature of what happens in Berlin is that they've got a very strong regional economic development, the Investitionsbank. So this bank that also invests into new businesses and startups. Good and luck that's with doing that run. Yeah. I was just going to say it's, <laughs> it's kind of maybe a bit of a legacy of that social mm. welfare um, looking out for, for people. So that's a government-funded bank but it's got um, – a board and it's run it's like a private bank. Then you've got this development of crowd vesting, mm-hmm. which I'm not sure how big that is in Australia. It's, but yeah, it hasn't really hit hasn't us. Hasn't hit I, off. Yeah, I know in Europe and in London it seems to be, mm. um, and that's when you know, people can, you know, the the average Joe and Jane in the street can in, and invest uh, similar to similar to a Kickstarter campaign, but you actually walk away with a little bit of equity, right? Correct. You have a share in that business. So one example of that business was this huge um, hotel uh, that started up on the north, the Baltic Sea, the north coast of Germany, not far from Hamburg, and that business was started through crowd vesting. So the, the CEO and the team of founders essentially just had the average Joe or as they'd be called in Germany, the Helmut or the Helga, um, investing into that business and then it's kind of taken off from there once they got a lot of po- positive press on that model. Then you've got Kickstarter, then there's another German um, kind of home-based, home-created uh, similar crowdfunding campaign, um, the next Start Next, so that's their kind of little version. So there, So there's a few different ways. A lot of people not really comfortable borrowing from family and friends, whereas perhaps in Australia people who are in the startup world are happy to go and door knock and ask family, friends, neighbours. I got the feeling and the impression that most people are happy to try to do a Kickstarter campaign rather than ask their mum and dad for a bit of capital to get things going. Um, But again, it just depends on the nature of what the business is and whether it's going to be a product or a service if you're doing an app or some kind of application web-based it, it varies but that's kind of the landscape the ecosystem that there is so a couple of interesting points i mean you mentioned early in the podcast um, um rocket internet were based in berlin or mm-hmm. are based in berlin yes. so, so rocket internet very controversial german company um because they um very much have um, piggyback of other business, they sort of copy other businesses essentially, right, mm-hmm. and bring it to Europe. Um, and, and it's three brothers involved. Is they're it? three brothers, and they're very reclusive. I actually was at a tech conference a few years ago and saw one of the brothers um, speak at a conference, which is very rare mm-hmm. for that to happen. And um, for the listeners, one of the copycat businesses that Rocket Internet had replicated was a co- it was called Studi Fortset, which is a a direct copy of Facebook. So they didn't come into any kind of legal issues with Facebook and this was going back maybe five to six years ago and it was only because they were targeting universities in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Right. So in that German-speaking um, part of Europe. And um, I think by now the platform's almost dead. It kind of has no competition because everyone's switched over to Facebook. But it had a very legitimate... Um, base and because they were only focused on German university students, that's how they tried to have their point of differentiation. But they've also established Zalando, which is kind of the copycat of Amazon. Um, so this is what they're renowned for. That's their kind of model that they start these businesses. They're happy to even call them copycat themselves, but they tailor them more to a German speaking continental European customer or consumer. I mean, I think Rocket Internet are a little bit of an outlier. I would, I mean, I'm not an expert in German business, but I would imagine they not their approach is not typically German, right? They're a bit more flamboyant, um, but as I said, the founders are quite kind conservative of, in yes, and don't give much. They don't do much, but that's but that it's in itself is quite typically German. The lack of wanting to be too much out there in the media that's seen as very Anglo-American. Mm. It's quite aggressive, and a lot of them don't want to be. And that's a very typical German character trait: just reserved not talking too much about money or getting ahead of yourself, just wait for things to happen um, in the background and that kind of is a character trait that you would see. So you, you've got a bit of a legal background. You studied law. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I once read many years ago an interesting article about how different German businesses are in general in terms of their corporate structure and governancy and approach. I mean, we're very familiar with the model that you, you have shareholders, you're under a legal obligation to maximize shareholders' interests, the directors um, are legally accountable um, for that. Um, run us through um, that the German um, the, the German structure is slightly differently, tr typically, isn't it, to that? Well, I guess it's, again, probably due to history. So you've got your typical Siemens or the SAP, um, you've got the automotive industry, and they're all run with that board of governance or what we just w recently witnessed with Dieselgate and Volkswagen. And so they do have, of course, that the board of directors, there is government governance, good governance measures that have to be um, brought to bear. The other thing, though, is that what you don't really see, and I mentioned this before, was because you have this Mittelstand, they're those old family-run businesses down like in... Faber-Castell, right? Faber-Castell, they're not stock-listed. Right. So a lot of the board members or even the Porsche family who bought out um, Volkswagen, that family is also reclusive. They're, it's a family-run board. So essentially they're, they've brought in some experts onto this board, but they for themselves are still running the company that was set up by the grandfather or the great-grandfather some 200 years ago. So it's quite unique to Germany. So then you've maybe then got what we're talking about too, let's say startups or smaller businesses, mums and dad type businesses, and they run on um, perhaps what we might be more familiar with here in Australia, so some kind of like a PTY. Right. So they're kind of the three structures that you would see depending on the nature of the business. But generally you're right, it's not familiar to Australians or um, even perhaps to British uh, people who come to the continent and try to get a foothold in the German market simply because – it's been so structured and um, and they do say when it comes to taxes that the German tax system is the world's most complicated. So you've got business structures and then you've got this very complicated tax system. So they kind of almost feed off each other in a way. And um, Joe, who's listening on, the, on Periscope, actually was kind enough to do the translation from 2.5 billion euros. Joe, throw us that number again. Um, we were trying to convert the amount invested in Berlin startups in 2015 is 2.5 billion euros. We're trying to convert that into US dollars or Australian dollars. And Joe, Joe threw that up. But um, I'll see if she <laughs> can. <laughs> if you're listening to us on and watching us on Periscope, special shout out and thank you to you. My name is Kevin Garber. We're chatting to Petra Zlatevska. Um, who's a Berlin-based writer, lecturer, communications professional, uh, multilinguist. Um, do they call those polyglots or that's something else? A polyglot is, well, the French tend to say polyglot. So that's right. what a French person, that's the word that they use for someone that speaks more than one or two languages. Okay, so I got it right. There so we go. It's, it's, it's perfectly, um, perfectly correct. Terrific. And um, so... You know, the Israelis having a big impact on the Berlin tech scene. Israeli startups are very well known for being having very deep technology. Mm. You know, Australian, um, you know, startups a lot of the time are, are, are criticized for being a bit light on the technology. You know, just having an Uber for this or an Uber for mm. that. But the Israeli tech goes incredibly deep um, into agri-tech, fintech, um, <laughs> Life sciences as well. Life sciences. Very all, um, on the Berlin side of things, um, w what type? I mean, there's Spotify, which is um, obviously, um, you know, the music app. Um, there's SAP, which is the enterprise um, ERP system, mm -hmm. which is incredibly well known. Um, what, what sort of flavor of startups uh, is the, the sort of... Um, sort of focal point in Berlin. Any any trends or um, themes? Well, I guess maybe we need to distinguish. So the apps that you and those businesses you mentioned, um, so Rocket Internet was, let's say, a homegrown um, mm -hmm. business. But then you've also got these 
businesses and startups that have flourished and are because of the the founder who's not a German or not a Berliner and they've come in from somewhere else. So SoundCloud is another perfect right. example. So that was set up, it was a co-venture between a Swedish and a German and they from day one had SoundCloud as they wanted to make Berlin their their HQ. And that got bought by Twitter, I think, SoundCloud. Possibly. Or, or Twitter wanted to buy it. Wanted, yes. I think as far as I know, they still haven't sold. Oh, I, think, um, they've I, kept think, I think Twitter invested in SoundCloud. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, Twitter invested in SoundCloud, yeah. So they're the, the, the music uploading and sharing platform. And so generally I think it tends to revolve around music and culture. There's another, um, maybe not such a well-known app, but it was an app that was developed in Berlin to enable um, gallery and museum buffs to be able to go to any museum or gallery within the city of Berlin and all of the paintings and artworks were kind of preloaded onto this app and then you just have to, depending on where you were, if you're at the Neues Museum or at one of the photography museums, you could bring up the picture or the photograph and it would give you more information. So it was all on that app, whereas normally, you know, you have to go to every single museum and get those annoying headphones. Um, this app kind of alleviated the annoyance of doing that. So gender around music and culture. Um, food is another big one, interestingly, some food apps. There was another one created by an Australian, um, deskwanted.com, that mm -hmm. matched people in Berlin who were looking for a co-working space and they mm -hmm. were able to localise it to where they needed to find a space, where they want it to be and what their budget was for a co-working space. Um, so, and crowd, um, so in terms of office space, it's such a legitimate business to set up a co-working office. So one of the big ones that's come out of Israel is called Mindspace, mm -hmm. started in Tel Aviv. And they've had their first German incarnation in Hamburg and now in Berlin. And essentially it's just a, a hub for entrepreneurs and there's meeting rooms. It's different it's to WeWork? Different to WeWork. So because this one, WeWork, there's Israelis behind that as well. That's true. That's true. And I <laughs> and think they're, they're in competition. Going, they're going very – they're going great guns. They're they're they've just opened in Sydney. Have they? I yeah. did see that somewhere. So I think another thing to note is it's a legitimate idea and a business to provide – this co-sharing, um, co-working office space and have then a community that you build around that through events and then you charge people for their desk or their private office. I There's membership rates. So that's kind of an, in itself. When I started my first business many years ago and, and took the leap to get a small office, the most stressful experience mm. because it's a fixed cost. Anything that's a fixed cost it's a fixed cost for three years, right? So anything that's a fixed cost just causes stress because, um, you know, it's uh, something that you can't easily get out of. Mm. So the co-work space is just wonderful. It's just it's, – it's such a boon to entrepreneurs to be mm. able to go to a co-work space. I mean, anything up to six, seven staff probably pays you just to be in the co-work space. Absolutely. And especially in a city like Berlin where – and it was notorious for having very affordable um, office kind of rent space, whether in an old factory, very low red tape to kind of – you don't have to get a, an approval to stick in some walls. It was very much kind of do as you like, um, minimally regulated. And so that kind of has made it much easier to set up these co-working spaces, legitimate businesses, and operate them professionally. And, um, and in a city like Berlin where it is – quite transient there's people coming in and out all the time deals might be done there but you might have to sign in frankfurt or go meet your other investors in poland it's a great hub to be there um but you know you don't have to be permanently locked into a three-year lease as you just mentioned um what's angela merkel like um so what, what's the view of angela merkel in general amongst uh, you know younger tech entrepreneurs etc i mean obviously we we hear just very selective news about you know the asylum seeker issue and mm. the migrant issue and things like that um she seems to she's obviously a very um smart bold capable woman but what's the feeling towards her we have no sense of that in australia of what the mm. um you know the people feel really well, I suppose because she's a politician, she's not a business expert or an entrepreneur and she's not kind of even the Minister for Finances. But she has, um, together with the Australian government, there's been this launch of the German-Australian Advisory Council two years ago mm -hmm. and that was set up to promote 
growth in business and trade between Germany and Australia. And she was quite a key driver of that. So specifically for Australia and Germany, um, part of that reasoning was to kind of share a bit more of knowledge. Um, the younger kind of um, professionals have kind of exchange programs make sure that the business and tech world um, between these two nations are kind of being able to be strengthened. So the view of most young people about Merkel is that she's a strong leader and she's very capable. And um, in terms of business, she's obviously very pro-business, but she's also very much there for kind of the little person, which is interesting considering she's from a centre-right Christian party. Um, so she is a, a, she's a professional, a real consummate professional, but in terms of going out to business, she tries to be on side. She'll go to kind of meetings with um, big industry boards, but then she'll also be perhaps at like the opening of a new factory. So she tends to play both hands. Um, Petra Zlatevska, thank you so much for joining us. Petra is um, a Berlin-based writer, lecturer, communications professional, speaks many languages, lawyer. Go check out her website. We'll put a link to your um, Twitter as well as your website, and people can reach out to you there. Um, really nice to have a guest in the studio. Um, I believe you're going back to Berlin, but you'll be back to Sydney in a few months for good. Mm -hmm. um, so welcome back, and um, interesting to talk to you and find out a little bit about the tech scene in Berlin. Thank you, Kevin. It was wonderful to be here.